welcome to Wandsworth Heritage Festival. Every year we celebrate and learn about the history of Wandsworth with Wandsworth Heritage Service and Wandsworth Libraries. And today I am bringing you some information about clothes through crafting and making paper dolls. My name is Carolyn. I'm the children's librarian at Battersea and York Gardens Libraries. And this year's theme for the Wandsworth Heritage Festival is houses and homes. Uh, so as well as talk about some fashion of the Victorian and Edwardian periods, I am doing this through the frame of one of my favorite houses in Wandsworth um, and talking about some clothes that might be typical of um, being worn around the house, a great house. Um, so probably not your average people, but your upper class people. So today I'm going to talk about Ashburton House. Here it is. You can see it is very grand indeed. And this is where Ashburton Estate is now standing. So this house isn't standing any longer, um, but it was built between 1853 to 1854. This photo though is from 1888. So this is right in the Victorian era. The house itself is described as Elizabethan in style, so more from the Tudor area. Uh, but we can see some very fashionable children out front. Now I don't know who those children are, but um, I was very inspired. So today we are going to make some Victorian and Edwardian paper dolls inspired by the folks that lived or might have lived in Ashburton House. These are some of the books I used uh, for inspiration and information about clothing of the ages. And there are plenty more books about fashion in our children's libraries. I will leave a link to a catalog list below so you can reserve any of them if you like. So I've created a template for you of some dolls, but of course you can draw your own. Um, I have created two children here. Now these two are inspired by the Carlyles, Emily and her husband, John. Now John was a civil engineer and ship owner who managed the Blue Star Line. Um, so, you know, quite an important family and Emily was his wife. There is a fantastic little snippet from the Old Bailey records of a very interesting court case regarding a mysterious figure in a puff of smoke. Um, so I'll leave a link to the Wandsworth Heritage Service blog about that so you can read more. Um, but I was very intrigued by that. So that was my inspiration. And of course, all you need to do if you want to use my template is print it out and cut out our friends. Now, I've also left a template of all the clothes we discussed today online so you can cut those out print cut and color them in or of course you can design your own I use the books I mentioned earlier for inspiration and the Victoria and Albert collections are a great resource as well you can search for different clothing of the time period so I used that as a lot of my inspiration too so we begin in the 18 50s when Ashburton House was built and as you can see this woman is very shapely but most people probably did not have the desired figure of the Victorian era which was very hourglass so to achieve that we needed our foundation of undergarments and let me tell you it is a lot of undergarments so we'd begin with our chemise, which was just a, a kind of t-shirt blouse. That would be your foundation garment. And this would protect your other garments from getting dirty, protect your skin from the tight corset knickers. So previous to this, and still sometimes during this area, the leg and uh, crotch area would actually be open. Um, so it would not be closed like a regular pair of what we think of as knickers or trousers today. But uh, this elegant lady has hers closed. And then of course, the arguably most important part of a 
Victorian ladies wardrobe was the corset. So at this time, it was um, a very hourglass shaped corset, very in at the waist. Apparently a lot of brides wanted to achieve a waistline no larger than their age. And as you can imagine, as people got married quite young at this time, that was a, a feet, usually 18, 19, maybe even 17 inches. So that goes on top of the shimmies and bloomers. And as you can see, she's almost wearing what, I mean, she's wearing what we would basically consider full coverage these days, uh, but we are not close to being done. Stockings and they didn't have really the elastic that they we have now. So you'd have to hold them up with a garter belt. A lot of um, corsets had built-in garters, but uh, I found that difficult to draw. <laughs> now to achieve the 1850s look of a nice full bottom, we have a crinoline, and this is basically a cage skirt that would go under your dress to give you with those wide hips. And uh, you can just barely see it here. It's of course hard to do in two dimensions. There was a bustle at the back. So that was what gave that big bum shape, um, which was quite stylish in the very early Victorian era, the 1830s-ish. Um, by the 1850s, still, still pretty stylish, um, but a little less pronounced usually. So the crinoline, goes over like that. And then some crinolines would have a built-in petticoat that would go over top, but otherwise you would of course need your petticoat, which would add some more volume and uh, warmth as well if needed. So there we go. She's got her undergarments on. It's quite, quite a few layers there. We've got a lot of tabs going on already. Uh, so. I can only imagine the time it would take to get ready in the morning and a mistress of a house like Ashburton might might have a lady to help her get all that on and get her corset nice and tight. But of course, the garment that all this faffing about were meant to support was the dress. So in the 1850s, uh, the dresses were quite Full. The sleeves were quite full. This style here is called a pagoda sleeve. Um, this look of tiered dresses was quite popular. And this is a dress that you might um, call a day dress, be more typically worn at home. A little bit different from the loungewear we wear today. <laughs> you would probably still wear shoes at home at this time. Um, the heeled boots weren't quite as popular. A flatter boot um, was a bit more on trend that laced up as well. Uh, so let's put those on her feet. The hair was usually worn parted in the middle and, and pulled back, um, but a bit like loose and with volume around the face. And kind of caps, little lace caps, instead of really a hat, especially indoors, of course, or um, at home. So there we go, poor thing. She does seem to be drowning in this a little bit, but it is a very pretty dress. So this is something that might be worn by uh, the mistress of, the, of Ashburton House when it was first built. Victorian fashion had so much change and so many different purposes. You got dressed for every little different occasion. Um, but as I said, we're gonna stick to mostly what would be going on in the domestic sphere of the home. So later in the century, different hair became stylish. We have this kind of piled on top of the head um, with a bun look. They'd frizz it out. And that was inspired by the Gibson girl, which was kind of a, a fictional um, ideal woman based on drawings by Charles Gibson. Um, and that is how that woman wore her hair. So that became quite stylish. Uh, and that would continue to be stylish throughout the turn of the century. Gosh, I can imagine taking all this off was just as time consuming as putting it on, but also probably quite a relief. So now in 
maybe the late 1880s, the 1890s, when that house was, we have the photograph with the children and we learn about Emily and John Carlyle. There was a big dress reform uh, movement. So a lot of people were worried about the ill health effects of those tight, tight corsets. And indeed women would faint, uh, there were reports of cracked ribs. A movement towards slightly more practical clothing, I don't know if we call them that in today's terms, began including a, uh, what was called a combination, which was kind of the chemise and the knickers in one. As we move more towards sports uh, for women, such as cycling and tennis and hiking, um, this move towards comfortable, practical clothing continued. And this corset is what was called a health corset. So it's still achieved a shapely figure, um, but was ostensibly healthier, didn't quite squeeze the air out of you so much, or crack your ribs, all that good stuff, and was purported to be more comfortable for sport. Uh, this one was inspired by the uh, Jaeger corset, um, one of which is in the Victoria and Albert collection. Of course, many women would still be wearing the very tight corset, the crinoline, um, but a sleeker shape came more into practice. So you would still have a petticoat and your stockings, um, but as you can see, this is new kind of day dress that is a bit sleeker. The bustle, the bum part of the dress is not quite so pronounced or important. Uh, the sleeves are narrower and it's a bit more tailored. We're getting towards a more menswear inspired look for women. Um, of course, we need our shoes. So now you can see the heel is starting to become more fashionable. Buttons, uh, a little more embellishment there on the shoes. And this is a style that would continue into the Edwardian era. Be around the house, I don't, I don't really think she'd wear a hat or anything, but if she wanted to go outside for a little stroll, she might wear a hat. These kind of flat, again, a little bit menswear inspired hats with some modest embellishments might be on trend. Oh, the wind blew it away. And Victorian ladies did not like to get uh, suntans, so they would probably have a parasol with them to shield them from the sun. There we go. So the Victorian era lasted from 1837 to 1901. 1901 was when Queen Victoria died and the crown passed on to Edward and thus began the Edwardian era, era, which went from about 1901 to 1910 when King Edward died, but it's often considered to be up to the First World War. And again, things became a bit more modern for women, uh, but still a very shapely look was desired. And in fact, a quite intense corset came back into fashion. So the foundational garments were foundational. In this era, we have our chemise and our knickers as well, but they're getting a bit fancier, a bit more towards what we might see as modern lingerie bit lacier. We do still have a petticoat, but it's a bit slimmer to accommodate the slimmer lower half figure that was desired. As in the Victorian era, the corset is an extremely important fashion garment, but in the Edwardian era, it becomes what is called the S-shaped garment. So we still have quite a small waist, but which is again hard to show you in 2D, it would push out your chest and push out your bum. So you'd kind of lean forward. Probably not very comfortable and probably not very good for you, but it was the fashion. <laughs> so here we go, let's get her in it. Now around the house though, because of this, it was quite fashionable for ladies to wear tea dresses. Um, for having their friends over for tea, for entertaining around the house, and some still wore corsets, but the tea dress had a very loose form which allowed women to dispense of the corset, or at least maybe wear it a little bit 
looser. It was very lacy and frilly. Um, so while menswear inspiration was quite popular, so was very fem traditionally feminine clothes. The hairstyle, the Gibson girl hairstyle was still quite popular. Now in the early Victorian era, women were very much contained to the household. There was a return to extremely strict ideas of what men should do and what women should do. But by the Edwardian era, women were wanting to be a bit more focused out of the home. So after having tea with her friends, perhaps Emily Carlisle would don her outside garments. <laughs> As you can see, very menswear inspired. We've still got a bit of a puff sleeve, but it's quite tailored. Um, it's even got a tie and a high starched collar like men would wear. Um, and she might wear this out for a stroll to go to the shops. Hats were very stylish, big, big, big hats with embellishments like feathers. And she might also wear this perhaps to go campaign for women's rights such as the right to vote. So of course this, this was the era of the suffragette, lots of protest um, to get women, largely white women, the right to vote. Now men's fashion didn't change as rapidly during this time and in fact has not even changed that rapidly since. <laughs> they did not need their hourglass figure, so their undergarments were a bit less involved, though some did uh, try, wear corsets. There were corsets for men, at least in the early Victorian period, but largely they would wear a vest and some uh, knickers as well. Uh, and there was this kind of whole suit together, just like the ladies combination as well, that originated in America and became relatively popular. Now this was a men's suit back then, and as you can see, it actually, you could probably buy a suit quite like this, maybe not quite the high starch collar, and maybe a different tie. But um, it honestly hasn't changed that much since the Victorian era. Beau Brummel decided that after all the, the sort of flamboyancy, the curly wigs and lace and frills of the late 1700s for men, decided that that's not how men should dress at all. They should dress plainly, simply, everyone should look the same, um, and should look very tailored and sleek. So something like this has been a staple of men's wardrobe since the Victorian era. Of course, the difference is that during the Victorian and Edwardian era, this would be an everyday garment for an upper class man. Um, so now we have a bit more casual wear, t-shirt and jeans kind of thing, whereas this would be a bit more the equivalent of t-shirt and jeans for an upper class man then. Um, and of course, if you were going out in the day, a hat was an important accessory in the uh, late Victorian and Edwardian era for smart occasions, you'd wear a top hat, or you might just wear a bowler hat out for a stroll with your wife. Children's fashion did not change as much during this whole time period either, but for older children, more or less, they just dress like mini adults. Ho hopefully without the corset, some older children did wear corsets as well, um, which many fashion reformers campaigned against. And a nice hat, straw hats became quite popular in the Edwardian era. For little ones, it was quite common for boys and girls alike to wear dresses until they were older. Um, and the sailor suit became quite popular. And actually it's still a reasonably popular look for babies today. So that's of course just nautical inspired and they'd wear stockings and, and boots similar to grown-ups as well. So there we go. We have a lovely family, like the sort that might have lived in Ashburton House from 1850 through to the First World War. Now here is a photo of Ashburton House from 1947. As you can see, it's not quite as well taken care of. They don't have the lovely lush decorative garden out front. Um, and eventually it was demolished to make way for Ashburton Estate. So there we have it. Corsets and crinolines and 
feathered caps. Oh my. I hope you enjoyed that. Like I said, you can download the templates of the dolls and the clothes or use inspiration from books or the Victorian Albert Museum or maybe some of your favorite movies. Please share them with us on Twitter. And if you would like any more resources on these topics, just email heritage at gll.org to find out more. And there's lots more for grown-ups and children alike for the Wandsworth Heritage Festival. Follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And have a wonderful week. Bye. Bye.